This is Ben Rennick from Renner Crypt Tiles, and you're listening to Herp Herp Hooray. Here we should work in teams. I tend to think of myself as a one-man wolf pack. You're about to enter information overload, a worldwide transmission with Herp Herp Parade's featured breeder of the week. Here's your host, Jason Rossi. What's up, world? Welcome back to H3. I'm your host, Jason Rossi. We're streaming live on RossiReptiles.com and, as always, on iTunes. This week's featured breeder of the week is here and has a few projects that shows that if you dink, it pays off. Ben Rennick from Rennick Reptiles is here. Uh, ben, welcome to Herp Herp Hooray. It's great to be here. Awesome. So why don't you tell our listeners about the orange gene you have there you're working with. It seems to uh, do some amazing things with the animals. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I actually, it's a gene I just kind of randomly stumbled upon a few years ago. Um, it just kind of randomly popped out of just a cat to patch female I got in. And uh, basically, everything pops out extremely orange. Um, the original pairings, I think, was it came from a uh, black pastel pinstripe to one of the original orange animals. And um, I got, you know, black pastel pinstripes, the orange black pastel pinstripes, and then, you know, oranges and pinstripes and all the other stuff. And um, what it really does is it really just cleans everything up. And... I've noticed um, in some of the projects, it really seems to reduce a lot of the pattern as well. So it doesn't just, you know, add in the orange, but it actually reduces a lot. And I talked to Oz about it, and it's definitely not the same thing as an orange dream because it definitely doesn't do quite the intensity that the orange dream does. But, you know, I mean, it's definitely something that just kind of, I guess you could call it like an enhance, just like an enhancer gene. So something that just brings in more color and reduces the pattern up a little bit. And um, I did go for supers this year. Um, I believe I got supers, but with the pairing that I did, it was one of those, like, ridiculous pairings. So it was anywhere up to, I think, seven or eight genes. So I wasn't really sure if I actually got supers or not or if it's just the really, really intense oranges. But um, I also decided I was going to change the name of it, which – um, I, I started calling it the Sahara ball python because it kind of changes everything into like a sandy yellow after you get so many genes into it. But I've recently just learned there is another ball python called the Sahara ball python, so now we're kind of going back and forth on if we should change the name again or not. Yeah, that's a good name. Uh, if you come up with another one like that, I wouldn't see a problem with changing it. But, you know, the orange works. So, I mean... It, it, it does. The only thing, like, since there already is an orange dream... We didn't want it to be confused at all just because, you know, they are they don't really do the same thing. So, you know, there's an or I don't want there to be like just an orange and an orange dream and stuff like that. So I was like, I want to change the name completely just so I can make sure no one gets confused on it. And apparently I picked a name that's already been taken, so <laughs> it doesn't doesn't really help much if you keep doing that. Well I was reading on your blog there and it says that uh people are trying to use your name in a scam, man. What what's going on with that? Oh, that happens a few times for me a year. Um, I don't know. It's just some people, I guess, it's desperate. They try to sell hats saying I sold them to them and all sorts of different stuff. And I can definitely say if you're, if you're going to try to sell hats under my name, you should at least get the projects that I'm actually involved in because that really helps. You know. <laughs> but, yeah, I had a customer call me up one day saying he bought um, like a group of albi- head albi- double head albino clowns. And I haven't actually produced any 100% double head albino clowns at the point that he called me. And um, so I was like, you know, who sold them to you and all this other stuff. And apparently some guy just, he took a ton of snakes in trade and sold this guy just a complete, I just, just two normal ball pythons saying I sold them to him as double head albino clowns. And um, you gotta, gotta have paperwork to be able to pull something like that off with me. Cause I mean, Everything that you get from me is going to have paperwork with it. So 
it's just one of those things that I wish I could stop it and I wish I could control it happening, but, you know, some people just get desperate, I guess. People, take your time, search out the people, contact them. You know, it's not that big of a rush where you need them that day, you know. You take yeah, your time exactly. Think about it. <laughs> but uh, that Calico Queen Bee, man, getting into the pairings you got that, to the pewter blast, what was the outcome of that? Um... Uh, there was all sorts of stuff, actually. The Calico Queen Bee actually has a, a little bit more to it that I've discovered. Um, over the last year, I've kind of been pulling stuff out of that one animal, and I've been backtracking where all the, the parents' lineage came from, and there's definitely something else in that original Calico Queen Bee male. And as of right now, I've just been labeling it, you know, just a plus sign, just because it's an addition to that gene. I haven't put an actual name on it yet. But basically what that does is it condenses all the patterns. And the Calico Queen Bee to the Pewter Blast Clutch, um, I got, let me, you know, I can just look at it right now. Um, you know, there's kind of the basic stuff that you get out of clutches like that. Um, it looks like there is a Super Blast with the extra gene in it, um, Killer Queen Spin, uh, queen spin that's possibly a calico, um, and most of the other stuff has that extra gene in it as well. But the only thing with clutches like that, you typically can't always tell exactly what you have until they shut out a couple times. Because certain genes, just like like the calico gene, for instance, and just certain combos, it's really hard to tell whenever they just hatch out because everything just hatches out solid white, and you can see like the faint pattern inside the snake and everything like that. But, you know, a couple of sheds down the, down the line, every single combo like that starts to actually develop more color, and it becomes a lot easier to see exactly what's inside every single snake. Awesome. Because it's kind of hard to tell that calico in there sometimes, isn't it? It is. I mean, certain things are more obvious than others. Um, I hatched out, like, a calico spinner blast this year, and that thing is just phenomenal. I mean, it's just it's got, like, a yellow stripe down the back, and the white just creeps all the way up to the top of that yellow. But in certain things like queen spins and queen bees and stuff like that, it doesn't really seem, you know, I mean, it, it probably varies with the low whites and high whites and stuff like that too. But, you know, um, it's a lot easier to tell after they shut out a couple times because then that white really starts to pop and then a lot of the other colors start to come in on the back. Definitely a powerhouse gene to have in your collection. Oh, yeah, for sure. That's, that's probably one of my favorite genes to have. So why don't you tell us about that pastel puzzle to Pied? Did you get a, pu a bunch of pastel double head puzzles, Pides? I didn't. <laughs> uh, she retained sperm, so I did not get anything out of that other than uh, I got pinstripe pet pied. Uh, she retained sperm from a pinstripe pet pied to the pied, and I got pinstripes and pieds. I didn't get any pinstripe pieds, but I got both of those. And um, so I didn't get any pastel puzzle or pastel double head puzzle pied, and that completely kills it. I actually... I got into the puzzle project um, earlier, I guess it was last year, and uh, the male actually, he bred four or five females, and I opened his hub one day, and he was just belly up, and I mean, he would, he ate the week before that and everything like that, and he just, he just passed, and uh, so from that point, I'm like just hoping so much that I was going to get females. And the first pastel puzzle clutch I hatched out was a pastel puzzle to a spot nose, and I got seven males and not a single female in the clutch. And from that, really from that point, none of the other females have taken. Uh, one of the females that I bred into the shield was that pied, and I bred a pinstripe uh, head pied to her earlier, and the pinstripe took. So I ended up getting one egg out of another one of that pastel puzzle clutches, and um, I got a spot nose head puzzle, and that's my only female from that entire project. So I am holding on to it for dear life and hoping I really do well on us later. Yeah, she's not going anywhere. No, no, she's like a little little safe in my in my racks. So why don't you tell us about the Huffman gene? What's going on there with that? You know, I've actually been learning a lot about that over the last couple months as well. Um, and honestly, uh, I've been going through, looking through a ton of stuff on a couple different things. And uh, as recently, I looked in more into the Black Razor, 
which um, that was produced, I guess, a season or two ago. And it came from E&G's line of Black Pastel. And from what I can tell, the Huffman and E&G line Black Pastel are basically the same thing. The Huffman doesn't have a solid black super, though. So the Huffman, whenever you bring two Huffmans together, you actually do get a super, but it looks like a really, really intense black pastel, I guess you could say. And it doesn't produce a solid black snake. But um, I've been working with the Huffman gene for three seasons now, and um, it's got a ton of potential. And this year I'm definitely going to be working on some projects that will hopefully put a lot more light on that project. Um, David Bellis produced the, he calls it the slick ball python this year, and um, that really kind of set off the Huffman project for me, kind of what I'm going to do this entire season with that project. But it's, it's definitely got a lot of potential. And with uh, the slick ball python, it's basically, it, it turned the snake almost an entire black color. And the slick was actually orange ghost, but I can, you can kind of picture what it looks like without the ghost in it. Um, but it turned that entire black color and put the stripes on the back. And there's like a faint pattern you can see inside of the, inside of the black too. So I'm, I'm thinking it's a project that's definitely going to, it's going to have a lot more really good combos in the long run. It just, it, it really took that one to kind of, you know, shine more light on it. Cause I patched out a few different things like Huffman pinstripes, Huffman bumblebees, um, even a Huffman humblebee this year. And I mean, they're, they're really nice looking, but it's really what you can do with them later that I think is going to really make that project, you know, come, come to light. Awesome, man. Well, congrats. Uh, that, Congrats also on that twin calico super blast, man. That's hitting the odds there, huh? Yeah, yeah. That's I, I've done horrible on my twin odds though. It seems like every time I hatch out a set of twins, one of them is always belly up the next day. I think I've only had one set that did perfectly fine this entire season. So I did lose one of those male calico super blasts. It was it didn't even make it to the second day. But the other one's doing great. <laughs> awesome. How about that uh, queen spin the pastel calico? Going on. The Queens and the Pastel Calico stuff, um, I can't remember what I got last year out of it. I definitely have done some really, really crazy stuff with just with those two combos. Um, I guess it was two seasons ago, I ended up hitting the just the max combo in that thing, and that was the Super Pastel Calico Lesser Spider Pinstripe. And that, it, it turned out to be a male and that guy would just did phenomenal for me immediately. Um, he never refused a meal, and he was already at the six to eight hundred grams within the same year. And I actually got one clutch out of him last season, and it was just laid, I guess, three four weeks ago. And I bred that male to an albino clown, and that's like probably my my most anticipated clutch this entire year with that one clutch just so I can see whatever, because you can't really lose on something like that, because just the minimum thing you can get is a pastel double-head albino clown. So it's definitely going to be a really cool long-term project. Man, if you got an albino clown, you're already winning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, that was another long shot that happened to me a couple of years ago. Actually, I bred uh, two double-heads together, and the entire clutch died other than one egg, and that one egg was the albino clown. Wow. So odds have definitely played in my favor on a few clutches, and I have completely bummed out on some other ones. So it's definitely a give and take. All right. Well, why don't you tell us about that gargoyle champagne, man? That thing's a stunner. The gargoyle champagne, um, probably my favorite champagne combo I've hatched out so far. Uh, you know, it, it basically a lot of people don't really like champagne stuff because everyone's under the impression that champagnes kind of wipe out all the pattern and things like that. And this was the first year I really hatched out a, a pretty good number of champagnes. And I've really, like, I've fallen in love with the gene entirely. Uh, the, the striping, um, the dashing, everything that snake can actually do, and every, every single one of them looks different. But the gargoyle champagne, I will say that one did kind of wipe out a lot of the pattern. But it turned to basically like a, a silver-purple color. And um, for anyone that doesn't know what a gargoyle is, it's a head red exantic cinnamon. And adding champagne into it, it just turned it into like this purple snake. And it was one of those, the one that I hatched out was one of those like really intense ringers. 
So it just looks like a purple tide. It's definitely probably the highlight of my champagne year so far. So was that the same combo as the silver purple champ combo that's on your blog? Or is that a different one? No, that's that's the same one, yeah. Okay. And I actually am updating my website with a whole new thing. So it will actually be updated hopefully, I guess, within the first month of the next year. So I'll actually be able to stay on top of it because right now I'm doing basically all of my own website stuff and I am as far away from a web designer as you could ever imagine. So it doesn't get updated as much as I really like it to. So we actually we got in a, a friend of mine. He rebuilt basically the entire website and he'll, he's making it a thousand times easier for me to actually update it. So I will actually be updating it as much as possible this upcoming year. Awesome. Give give me another uh idea for a show for you, 2000. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the outcome of the pastel red exanic clutch there? The champagne, you mean? Yes. Um, the outcome of the pastel champagne. Okay, so that was that one took me a little while to actually figure out. Uh, those, like, I did hatch out a pastel champagne red exanic for sure. Um, it's about... It is a lot more white. The red exantic, or the, I guess the head red exantic, you could say, it really kind of cleans up the champagne a little bit, and it puts in a lot more, I guess, dark colors on the side. And um, that's really the easiest way to tell the head red stuff is how much it cleans it up. And it gets rid of a lot of that striping that the normal champagne stuff has and kind of just jumbles it around. And with the champagne head reds and the champagne reds and the pastel champagne reds and head reds, it was one of those things that we had to really, really look very closely to kind of see what's hidden behind the white in the pastel champagne head red stuff. Um, I only hit one pastel champagne red, and basically it's kind of like a patterned head, and then it basically just turns white all the way down the body. And then it's got some of those – it's got some ringer in it too, but it, it didn't really have a lot of pattern in that one. Uh, the pastel champagne head red exantics ended up having a lot more pattern. Um, they actually, some of them have like a little bit of purple in them, but it's definitely, those were, those were very cool, but it's probably one of those projects that, you know, you really have to look at the animals very closely to see what you're going to get. Um, and today I ended up hatching out a clutch from a pastel or from a champagne head red exantic to a pastel calico pinstripe. And that one is pretty hard to tell. Uh, there's, there's definitely a lemon blast champagne that's possible, red exantic, possible calico. But some of that stuff, it's, it's getting kind of kind of hard for me to tell. So I think what I'm going to try to do is anything in there, I'm going to try to just take it back into Inchi. And then I'm going to try to figure out exactly what's in a lot of the champagne combos that we're actually hatching by taking it back into Inchi stuff. That sounds like a plan, man. Hopefully, <laughs> whatever, because we do, we do a lot of clutches with a lot of genes, and I can normally tell fairly easily, you know, what, what is what, but there are some clutches that, you know, you just get kind of ridiculous with it, and it's just like, yeah, I'm going to have to hold that back and just see exactly what's in it. Man, I can't wait for those days. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's definitely an up, upside and a downside. The downside is your racks fill up very fast. And it's all amazing stuff, but it's stuff like we, we actually breed snakes for a living. And it's, it turns out to be stuff that you can't really sell. And, I mean, we still probably – we have so many babies that we, we, you know, we just kind of want to hold back and just kind of see. And, you know, the food builds that up way faster. So. <laughs> well, I read you like to build racks, and you like seeing them there all empty, ready to fill up. So. Yeah, oh, exactly. Man. Hard talk. Ours are constantly full this season. Uh, since we're actually, this year we really, really bred all year round, and we're coming up on the last, I think, oh, seven or eight clutches, and um, we still have one more due right now, but as, of, as soon as that clutch lays, we just got our first ovulation of the season from a reticulated python, so it basically just kind of keeps going all year for us. So every time that we empty out a rack, it's like it just fills right back up. The reticulated, is that the ghost reticulated? 
project? Uh, we actually we have actually have quite a few retics actually. Um, the first clutch we should get this year will be Platinum Tigers. So I mean it's not like a really crazy clutch, but you know um, we we are doing some stuff with the Ghost Reticulated Python project this year. Um, hopefully we'll get Sunfire Ghost Reticulated Pythons and Tiger Ghost Reticulated Pythons, and then maybe Ghost Genetic Stripe. We hit one of those last year, but it's one of those odds at 1 in 16 that we tend not to be able to hit, so we're just going to kind of wait and see. But we, we produce probably oh, not, not as many retics as most people probably think that we actually do. We probably only produce three to five clutches a season, which is a lot of retics for us just because, I mean, you know, those clutches add up a lot faster than ball pythons. Yeah, there's some big clutches too. But yeah, this year is going to be, we're actually, we're really looking forward to this year. Um, last year, I think we got a little overwhelmed, kind of right in between the middle. This year, we're going to probably go a little bit further than we did last year and push the envelope on some, some clutches and kind of see what we can actually hit odds-wise. But um, yeah, it's, we're, we started breeding back in October, so it's hopefully going to be a pretty good season. Awesome, man. i got to tell you that the Super Pastel Lesser Calico is a cool-looking animal. I'm sure you're aware of that, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard for me to sell that stuff. I actually sold the Super Pastel Lesser Calico um, whenever it was about 1,000 grams. And it was a female, too. But mm. I, every once in a while, you have to kind of just let go of stuff if someone really, really wants it. But that's probably probably one of the snakes I most regret selling ever because it is just the nicest-looking animal. And a female, <laughs> and a female, yeah. <laughs> but I've I've hatched I haven't hatched another one out yet. Uh, I hatched out uh, pastel lesser calicos and stuff like that this year, and I mean I've hatched out them within other larger combos. But I really was really hoping to get another one of those this year, and I just missed odds on it. Lesser calico stuff is definitely probably my favorite combo between calico stuff so far, just because I mean whenever you put lesser into it the pattern just gets all whacked out and the color kind of changes into like a kind of like a purple, honestly. It's pretty cool. Definitely a winner for sure. So, tell us, is there a super rennick ball? Have you proved that out yet? That that one hurt this year. Uh, that was another retained sperm. That has happened to me so many times this year. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. But uh, I bred a rennick 2 my original female, and last season I bred the Blue Eyed Bucistic to her. And this year I hatched out an entire clutch of Mojave Renix and Lesser Renix, and then one normal Renix. So she retained sperm from last year and got one baby from that uh, original male Renix. So I'm going for it again this year. Uh, I'm going to do some combos with it. And I'm putting basically a lot of females in line just to see if I can get a super out of it. I've actually, the combos that I've done so far, um, I've done, you know, the Pastel Rennick, the Cinnamon Rennick, the Fire Rennick, and the Lesser Mojave Rennick. And I'm really, really hoping that the super is going to just blow everything out of the water for sure. But it's just females keep retaining sperm and it just kind of kills me. But we will definitely see for sure this year, because uh, I've got some version females I've been growing up from uh, some, a couple of Renick Fires that I've grown up, and uh, I'm taking a Renick Lester to them and a Renick Mojave to them. So I'm going to hopefully see this year if it actually takes. Awesome, man. Well, good luck. We're, we're pulling for you. Thank you very much. There's, there's quite a few projects that I've been working on the last few years that this year should be, should be a year that we can finally start to see you know, what What a lot of the stuff's capable of. Well, it would be great to see unfold right before our eyes. Appreciate that. So that Calico Queen Spin, I love the way that thing's looking. So how's it looking now? Better. You know, it hatched out basically solid white, and it's had all that, like, fate pattern to it. And now it's got, like, yellows and oranges, and the blacks are way more intense. And, I mean, it's it's just ridiculous looking. Um a lot of people think that, you know, once you get to so many genes into a snake, they all kind of look the same. But it's not really true after you grow them up a little bit. Uh, they do kind of hatch out similar. I'll honestly say, I mean, you know, that stuff does hatch out similar looking. 
you know, how most stuff will hash out white and then it kind of ages into it. But after about 400, 500 grams, they really start to develop that color and they just turn into phenomenal animals. But that thing is, he's working very, very hard for me this year and he will just breed anything he touches. So I'm very, very excited to see what he's going to produce this season. You got to earn his keep. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, the calico queen bee isn't too hard on the eyes either, man. That's a, another stunning animal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I hatched out – This is the calico queen bee has that extra gene, and I actually – I hatched out a calico killer queen bee without it, and then I hatched out a calico killer queen bee with it. And um, there's definitely, definitely a pretty big difference in a lot of that stuff. But uh, the calico queen bee stuff, I'm very excited about this year. I'm really hoping I can figure out exactly, kind of narrow down that one gene that's kind of hidden in there. Um, I've done a pretty good job at it this year uh, with a lot of the combos I've hashed out. And I, I think I might have hashed out the base, but the only problem is is the fact that the Calico Quimby with that gene would be a five-gene snake. And it's really, really tough to get the normal base genes out of breeding a five gene snake into anything. I mean, even if you run it through normals, it's it's a very long odd to get any base genes alone in any of those clutches. But so this year I'm trying to single everything out of it and I'm gonna kinda see, you know, what I can find in it. But um for now, you know, it's 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 in a lot of the combos I've hatched out and they're phenomenal looking. Um it's definitely tightening up all the pattern and everything. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing what all that stuff's going to do. It's just it's one of those things that it takes so much time to figure out projects that, and so many holdbacks to figure out projects that, you know, it's definitely it's taking, taking its toll on us this year. So, <laughs> Well, i got to tell you, man, you might be changing my mind here on the uh, spot nose gene, the pastel luster spot nose, pretty dope animal there. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a very, very cool animal. Um, hatched out like purple. I mean, it was just the coolest combo I've hatched out this year, or I guess it was last year. And uh, I've done some more lesser spot nose combos this year. Um, a lot of them have spider in it, so it kind of, you know, takes away from the, I guess, the uniqueness of the spot nose because spider kind of washes out a lot of that. But the past the lesser spot nose, um, it's, it's gotten kind of a, a yellow tone to it now. You know, after, after it ages up, it, you know, changes up quite a bit. But um, he's not really breeding for me at all this year. So <laughs> I, he's almost a thousand grams, and he just will not touch a female yet. So I'm still still working on him. But I'm excited to see a lot of the spot nose combos this year. Uh, we we hatched out a fair number of them last year, and uh, we're hatching another one out right now that I'll be posting pictures up. Hopefully, they'll be out within another couple of days. Uh, whenever things tip out for me, it takes them like seven days to come out of the egg. So it's very very frustrating because you can just get a, you get that little glimpse of it and you never really get to see what it actually looks like. But there's I'll, I'll be posting some new spot nose combos this week. And um, other than that, this year we did uh, spot nose kingspin, which is a spot nose lesser spider pinstripe, and spot nose queenspin, which is a pastel spot nose lesser spider pin, pinstripe. And um, what else did I hatch out? There was a one animal that came out really, really, really unique looking. Um, I brought a cinnamon spot nose to a killer blast. And I ended up hatching out, um, I, I believe it's the full combo. It would be a pastel cinnamon spot nose, spider pinstripe. And, I mean, it's just, it's the coolest looking thing. It looks like a super pastel, which I'm guessing it would be just from everything kind of reducing it. But it, it's like a pink color. And, um the head's completely washed out, and it's got this, like, kind of, I, w- I want to say dirtiness to it, but it's got the really thin banding or the really thin, like, striping, and it just looks like someone just took, like, a little ballpoint pen and just put little dashes all over the body and then threw, like, just, I guess, a bunch of black speckles all over it. So there, there's some really cool stuff coming out with that project, and uh, I'm really excited this year to actually start doing some Powerball combos. Um, the last two years, I have went for so many of them and I have missed odds on every one of them. I've I've done probably worse than 
so many people on Powerball odds that it's it's really been horrible. It's it's almost embarrassing. So uh, this year I've only hatched out one Powerball, and um, that was it. And I've done a ton of other combos with it, but Powerballs are just something I do not do well on odds on. That is definitely this, an impressive this, this combo. It is, and this this is going to be my year for it. I'm I'm hoping I can do really well on Powerball combos. May the force be with you. <laughs> so the Super Cinnies, man, I love them. I haven't produced any yet. Uh, hopefully will one day, but what's your experience with the duck billing? Um, Super Cinnamons, I had a horrible experience with. Uh, I got my first Cinnamons back in 2006. Um, by the time I was producing my first Super Cinnamons, no one told me about the kinking issues and all that other stuff that Super Cinnamons are known for. Um, so I actually hatched out, I think it was, it was, it was a lot and it like just broke my heart. I think it was probably maybe 12, 13 super cinnamons and one wasn't kinked. Um, and that one was like the only one that made it out of the egg. So super cinnamon stuff, I mean, it definitely, I would say if you're going to go for super cinnamon stuff, do it with black pastel and just kind of do the little outcrossing. I, I've hatched out quite a few cinnamon black pastels, the super form of that, and I haven't got a kink yet. Doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but it definitely seems to not be quite as severe as whatever I did cinnamon to cinnamon. But this year I went for the panda pied quite a, quite a few times, and I definitely missed it. I also missed black pastel pieds, but I got pieds, so I'm happy about that. But yeah, this this year I did. I didn't really do a ton of super cinnamon black pastel stuff. I think the only stuff I really did was in pies. And um, so I didn't really I didn't really produce a ton of it, but I, I didn't produce any kinks this year, so I'm, I'm very happy about that. Well, the pewter blast, definitely want to make one or ten of those guys, too. They're a definitely impressive-looking animal. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, that was one of the animals that I was uh, – I hatched out a pewter blast, and I also hatched out the orange or Sahara pewter blast, too. And the Sahara on that one – changed it up quite a bit, but the pewter blast stuff is really, really cool. Um, they always come out really, really purple, and they kind of kind of lose it as whatever they age, but at about, I'd say, 1,200 grams, it kind of seems like it just kind of comes back. So they're definitely like an, an ever-changing snake, but they're, they're very, very cool. Definitely on the list to make. <laughs> so what do you got planned for that spot no spinner blast? Um, Powerball combos, hopefully. <laughs> I'm really, really hoping I can do some good Powerball combos with it this year. Um, that and I'm trying to think of other stuff. I've, I've got quite a few spot nose combos going this year, but I'm going to kind of just see what they do with other things. Um, but I'm really trying to do, you know, see what the, a lot of the Powerball combos are actually going to look like, like pinstripe Powerballs and spider Powerballs. And, you know, I mean, the pastel Powerball is amazing. So, I mean, there's there's a few things I really, really want to take it to. But for the most part, you know, I'm definitely going to try to get the Powerball combos in there. Um, and this year, I'm really going to try to mix up a lot of the new genes that I have. So, like the Sahara stuff, I'm going to probably put, you know, Spot Nose Spinner Blast into that. And the, there's quite a few other stuff I haven't named in here, but I'll, I'll be naming it this upcoming year. Um, quite a few things that I'm kind of just – breeding together to kind of see what I can pop out of it, just so I can kind of, I guess, get, get a lot of different looking animals that, you know, you don't see every day that you can really, you know, look at it and go, you know, that's really impressive. That, that is definitely a wow animal. And um, so the Spot Nose Spinner Blast, Powerball stuff, um, I hatched out a Spot Nose Queen Bee last year, and that guy is going to quite a few things and uh, more Powerball stuff and then fire stuff I'm really excited about. Um, anything with spot nose fire and I'm like every time I think of a project I think of what I can do with it a few years down the line. So you know spot nose queen bee fire stuff will probably be going back into vanillas so you know uh, spot nose queen bee vanilla creams and stuff like that. So I'm definitely definitely looking forward to some of the projects that we're going to hopefully hatch out this year. <laughs> as long as we do good on odds. And that's like our worst enemy over the last year, especially on sexes. Sexes have been horrible for me this year. 
it's either everything I want to be a female, I had to have an entire clutch of males, or everything I want to be a male, I had to have an entire clutch of females. So it's just been just a weird year for me. you got to work that reverse psychology on them. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've, done, I've done well on some things, but for the most part, it seems like the stuff I really, really want, like every single spot nose combo that is any more than three genes has been a female. So it's really it's one of those things, like, I really love keeping them back. I just wish I could really breed them a little bit sooner than what I'm going to be able to do. So these genes you're talking about, are they animals that you acquired that were captive, captive hatched, or have you imported some snakes? Yeah, actually. Um, some years back, I ended up getting in a ton of captive hatch stuff. I just kind of went through and you know, found the weirdest stuff I could, and I just kept it. And a lot of it, I'd say majority of it, has proven to do something. Um, I'm horrible at naming stuff, which is like a huge downfall for me. So if you walk through my racks, there's like there's difference and there's amazings and there's question marks and there's there's just all sorts of random labels throughout my place just because, you know, I, I, I just haven't put names on stuff. But a long time ago, I got on a bunch of cats hatch stuff and it has thrown some really crazy things over the last couple of years. And this upcoming year will hopefully be the year that I can kind of see, you know, what they're actually going to do. So I can breathe some stuff back, back to each other and kind of, you know, see if there's a super form to a lot of it and just kind of see, what, see how it reacts with other genes. And I'm trying to do stuff that's not really involved in spider. I, we etch out so much spider and pinstripe stuff that I'm kind of looking for projects to kind of, I guess, just expand our collection a lot more. Um, so this, this year we're going to go through, see if we can get some supers, um, see if we can do some lesser combos with it. A lot of yellow belly stuff, uh, cause I mean, yellow belly obviously unlocks all sorts of crazy stuff. So I'm definitely going to see, you know, if the yellow belly does anything to a lot of the stuff that I had going on this year. And, um, you know, we're just going to, we're going to see, I'm really, I got my hopes really, really high on certain projects. So I'm really hoping some cool stuff will pop out this year. Well, I got to tell you, I got one captive patch female, and I got high hopes for her. <laughs> <laughs> I, I call her my inchier orange dream. She's my uh, little enhancer gene girl. She's tiny, so we don't know this yet. <laughs> That's Honestly, it's just one of those things, like, you, if you, as long as you pay close attention to your animals and you selectively breed stuff, you can always find something that the animal does. And if you can find a way to bring that back out, then, you know, I mean, you can make – some amazing looking animals and that's that's really what we do i mean i pay so close attention to every single thing i breed um i mean it takes us months to plan out exactly what we want to breed in a year just because we want to make sure we know everything's paired up to make the the best looking patterns or the, the craziest looking animals that we can just the nicest things and it's just one of those things that uh you know as long as you pay attention to what you have you'll notice a lot more things that the animals will actually do. And, you know, a lot of people, they, they kind of just run males through females. And by doing that, you don't really notice a lot of the stuff that, you know, it's really su it's subtle. And if you can kind of find those little subtle traits and put other stuff into it to enhance them, then, you know, you, you can make some really nice looking animals. Well said. So why don't you tell us about your jungle gene? Jungle Gene. Uh, I got that animal back in 2006. Um, she was just one of those wild-caught jungle-looking animals. Um, I really wished I would have slapped a different name on it, to be honest, um, because you think of jungle, you think of, like, pastel jungles and stuff like that, and it really has nothing to do with any of that stuff. Um, it just has a jungly pattern, the original animal. And I bred a cinnamon to it my first year. Uh, well, not my first year, but the first year I got that animal in. And uh, she produced, you know, just some different looking animals. Uh, they always have these reduced tails and they have these uh, just jungly patterns. And I held back basically everything from that clutch. And I just kind of kept breeding it into, you know, different things. And the last couple of years, I have had so many just crazy things out of that gene. And I haven't shown a lot of them um, just, just because I haven't really thought about how I'm going to take the project yet. But um, it does really weird things. And the, the weird thing about it is it 
doesn't do the same thing every time. Um, some of the jungle stuff I hatched out, like, in, let's just take jungle cinnamons, for instance, because I've hatched out so much variety in those things. Some of them come out looking, you know, like a normal cinnamon would, and then you just take all the pattern and you put a bunch of dashes in it and you mix it all around and just make it kind of a, like a jungly look. And some of the cinnamons that I've hatched out from those things, they turned pink. Like, the older they got, the, the more pink they got. And now I have some of these cinnamons, and, I mean, they're just like, there's a pink overtone through the entire body. And then some of the jungle cinnamons I hatched out have, like, a calico thing going on. And, I mean, it puts in all this white speckling into the sides, and it does some just crazy things. So this year I'm going to kind of see if I can manipulate, you know, each one of those little sections of what it's doing and see if I can bring it into other things. But, um my, my favorite jungle combo I think I hatched out this year was the Jungle Cinnamon Kingpin. And I, I, had, I was lucky enough to actually get a normal Cinnamon Kingpin and a Jungle Cinnamon Kingpin in the same clutch. And the Jungle Cinnamon Kingpin, it basically took all the pattern from a normal Cinnamon Kingpin, washed it out, lightened the animal up a ton, and then put a solid stripe basically from neck to tail. And it almost looks like a soul sucker combo. It's the craziest looking thing. And I've, I've been kind of seeing that the jungle's kind of, the more genes you put into it, it puts in more of the striping and it reduces a lot of the side pattern and brings up, you know, just cleans everything up. But um, some things it reacts a little differently and busies up the pattern, but definitely the more genes I put into stuff, the more it seems like it's just kind of making everything look really funky. So it's, it's, it's a cool, cool trait. So it adds the stripe to the bell complexes as well? It Kind of. Um, for instance, uh, this year I did a jungle savanna, which is Mojave cinnamon. And normally savannas, you know, they kind of have a broken up pattern and stuff like that. Uh, this one has absolutely no pattern. It's just the, the sides on the savanna, basically from the neck down to the tail, wash all the way up. So, I mean, there's there's no breaks in it. And then there's just a single stripe from head to tail. So it's just completely clean sides with a solid stripe down the, down the back. It's phenomenal looking. And um, I'm definitely noticing that the normal jungle lessers and Mahalis I've hatched out, it basically manipulates the pattern. It doesn't really clean it at all. It just jungles up everything. So it basically takes the pattern, makes it really busy, uh, makes it kind of more jagged type of thing. It's really only whenever you mix it with uh, typically two to three genes that it really does, you know, kind of manipulates the pattern a lot more in the reduced side. All right, so what's the verdict on the super pastel, black pastel spider, possible het fire, and orange dream? You, you figure that I one out yet? No, I'm figuring <laughs> it out this year, hopefully. <laughs> uh, I'm still debating on how I'm going to try to figure it out because I really – Really want to breed a pastel lesser spot nose to it. But this year um, I got a tri-stripe, and I was kind of hoping I could use him to kind of break down some of these bigger females that I have just so I can be 100% sure what's in them. That animal, the only reason it was kind of hard to know what that is, that animal, um, was because it was actually a multi-sired clutch. And since it was a multi-sired clutch, um, only that one animal hatched out of it, and I'm just not sure which male actually took. Because it was either a fire orange dream or it was a, I think it was a fire orange dream or a pewter blast. So, yeah, it, it was either a pewter blast or a fire orange dream. So we're, you know, we're 50-50 on what actually took in it. I, I think it's actually a super pastel black pastel spider. I think that's what it is. I hatched out a couple of those this year. And they look similar, not exact, but I, I don't really know for sure. So I, I really want to read the past unless you spot notes to it just so I can get something crazy out of it. But I'll probably end up doing the tri-stripe and just kind of breaking down what actually I get. You can't go wrong with the tri-stripe. You can't. No, I was, <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited about hatching those out. I'm taking the slow route, and I'm just, you know, I'm going to have to raise up a whole group of heads, but... I'm very excited to actually start hatching some of that stuff out. And we are definitely doing some crazy stuff with it. I want to do kind of both routes. I want to go 
with some things that might break the pattern up a little bit to kind of see what it does. And then I want to make sure I stick with the solid stripes. You know, I want to make sure it stays clean and, you know, it's fixed to its name with the tri stripes. But I kind of want to go both routes just to kind of see how it reacts with different things. Well, we'd love to see those guys in videos. I always look forward to seeing your YouTube videos. What's your YouTube channel? Uh, YouTube.com backslash Renick Reptiles. Yeah, man, appreciate you banging out all those videos you did there, man. I was running through them last night. We need you to uh, go ahead and run through the new facility for us. And yeah, I know. <laughs> new animal for us. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, you're, you're one of the very, very many people that are on me about making a, another video of the facility because our, we actually had to redo our entire facility this year, uh, basically so we could make more space. Um, we actually, uh, we have a 3,500 square foot building. Um, it's, you've got a walkout basement level and then a main floor. And we had all of our breeding animals and everything upstairs. But this year we hatched out enough babies that we decided to move all our big tanks downstairs so we could put all of our babies in where the big tanks were. And this year's just been so ridiculous with me hoarding my own snakes. So it's I'm hor horrible about it. Um, so I'm I keep adding more racks. I'm just like I'll just push it off another week. I'll build these racks. It'll look better. And one of these days I'm gonna just bite you know bite the bullet and just actually make a video of it. Um, hopefully soon. <laughs> Please do. What's well, going to pay yeah. off holding back all those animals, too? I mean, you know that. Oh, it, it definitely does. Um, other than, it doesn't pay off my food bills, but it definitely <laughs> definitely pays off in the end. You get those, those food, the food bills kind of kill me, but for the most part, you know, it, it does, does definitely pay off. Well, I got to say that Orange Black Widow is a pretty wicked animal. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, the original one that I hatched out, um, it was a phenomenal-looking animal. I mean, normal black widows come out purple and, you know, kind of like a silver tone. Uh, the orange one, I mean, it's just, it's orange, you know. And it, it came out just no purple on it whatsoever. It's just a complete solid orange animal. And um, as it actually grew up, it's just, it's gotten more and more and more orange. And I was really hoping I would do really well on those that clutch. And I really – I don't think I did as well as I had hoped. Um, I read – that was really my main orange project this year was I took an orange black pastel pinstripe to the orange black widow. And I was really hoping I could get some crazy stuff out of it. It seems like, you know, I, I got one of the super cinnamon black pastel – things it's it's purple i think there's pinstripe in it but i'm not 100 percent on that but for the most part you know i, I got a an orange black pastel i i believe it's a super orange spinner blast and a super orange lemon blast and then i got an orange black pastel spinner and a pastel orange and for how many jeans were in that clutch it seems like i just completely bombed on it but for the most part, uh, that animal definitely did really, really well for me this year. Um, I hatched out one other one uh, from last year, another orange black widow, and um, it's a little bit lighter than the original one I hatched out, but they definitely don't seem to brown out quite as much as a lot of the other, I guess you could say, pastel combos do. Whenever you add the orange into it, it really it takes a different route. So instead of going the brown route, it kind of goes into the orange route. And the orange, is de the orange deepens a lot, but it doesn't really seem to put in the brown as much as it does, you know, just a really deep orange. Have you put the orange with the champagne gene yet? I haven't. That'll be this year for sure. Um, that's one of those things that I, I really wanted to do a ton with it, but I didn't have enough females to actually breed into it. I wanted to see if there was going to be a super to it first, and... Um, I'm not. I'm still not 100% convinced that I, you know, got a super, or if I didn't get a super. But this year, I'm definitely going to do a champagne to it and kind of see what what happens with that. Which I, I will say that anyone that's breeding champagnes, if you breed a champagne to something, or if you put a champagne in a tub with a with a female, and you don't really want that champagne to breed that female, don't do that because that may have like the champagne stuff. I I think I put him with the female for an hour sometime last season and then I bred a queen spin to the same female for like the in, probably six months 
and I ended up getting champagnes. And that's happened to me, and I think, like, four different clutches. So I will definitely say the champagne stuff, like, if you breed the female, you're going to get champagnes, and they just keep they keep on coming. So <laughs> need to give me one of those. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what expos do you vend if uh, people want to come out and see you and your animals in person? We actually, um, this last year, we did a lot more shows than we normally do. Um, this year, we're going to try to hit um, most of the NARBC shows. Uh, I don't think we're going to do the one in Texas in February, but we'll be at Timley Park in March. Um, we'll be in Anaheim, California in September, I believe it is, uh, Timley Park in October. Um, there's a show in Texas in August. So that in ARBC show, we should hit that one as well. Um, we also do St. Louis, Missouri, um, that show. We typically, typically I think it's once every two to three months, but we typically hit that show as well. Um, if Kansas City doesn't fall on the same weekend, then we hit the Kansas City Reptile show as well. So, you know, we, we stay pretty busy with them, but, uh, you know, we, I'm one of those people that traveling just, like, wipes me out entirely. So doing shows is very, very hard on me, not to mention the animals. So it's one of those things, like, we try to hit as many shows as we can, but we only do as many as we we actually can, you know, so we don't fall too far behind the work, and, you know, we don't put a lot of stress on the animals. And we kind of rotate, too. We don't really – we try not to bring the exact same animals to every show, even if it's you know, a month apart, it's one of those things that, you know, we don't really like transporting animals if we don't have to. So we kind of rotate different animals into the shows and stuff like that, too, just so, you know, we don't want to cause as little stress as possible on any of the animals. Well, if you ever make it out to New York, there's a White Plains show that's a pretty good show that you probably do pretty well at. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it. I've, I've actually, we've we've heard about it, and we've actually, we've talked about it. Um, we actually, we just had our daughter, uh, this year, she turns one in March. So it's those out of state shows that, you know, we, since we have, you know, a, a newborn daughter, it's one of those things like we try to hit shows, but at the same time, like we just want to spend as much time with her as possible. So, <laughs> yeah, I have three little ones, so I know exactly what you mean, man. I'm just rushing home to hang out. <laughs> exactly. So what's your uh, favorite one to go to as a, you know? Yeah, Tinley Park is, you know, it's, it's only about six hours drive for us. So it's not, you know, it's not really that brutal of a drive. Um, you know, it's just, it's one of those shows that I know I have a ton of friends up there. Um, I get to see a lot of the customers that, you know, I sell to throughout the year. Um, that show has expanded so much over the last couple of years that, you know, I mean, so many people go to that show, and they just, I know Brian just, like, extended the show to a whole different section now as well, and it's just a really, really big show, and it's probably my favorite to go to and to vend, so it's definitely, definitely a good show, and it's nice to get out of the house every once in a while. I've learned breeding snakes for a living. You kind of come, like, you kind of turn into, like, a little monk that just hangs out in the snake building all day, and it's it's, it's nice to actually, you know, get out for a weekend. <laughs> So what is your take on the war on pet owners? I mean, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Uh, we all are. So what do, what do we need to be doing? What's your take? Well, um, I, I am a very strong supporter of U.S. ARC. Um, I always will tell people, you know, do any money to U.S. ARC and do whatever you can. You know, I mean, stay in focus with it. You know, call your local reps and make sure that, you know, everyone kind of knows what's going on um, and know how it's going to affect you. Uh, with us, since we do it for a living, you know, it's one of those things. And we do breed big snakes. You know, we do breed reticular pythons. Um, I bred yellow anacondas up until last year, and I don't really see any real reason to do it anymore. I'm still going to keep them. I'm still going to teach my kids about them. Um, you know, I love the species. Uh, it's It's sad. Everything about it, you know, it's, like the day that we learned we couldn't sell yellow anacondas across state lines anymore is just kind of like, it just kind of broke our hearts. You know, I mean, it's one of those things that, you know, that species just won't be in captivity for that much, for very much longer. Uh, not many people even breed them. Uh, we have a pretty decent collection of them, 
and now they're just kind of pets. So, you know, I mean, it's just as long as you can stay on top of things, you just call your local reps and let them know how stuff like this is going to affect you. And anything that's not false science would be always positive, in my opinion. So, <laughs> But, you know, definitely donate to US Arc or PJAC and just try to stay as involved as possible. Um, I know, I mean, even myself, you know, it's one of those things that uh, I know a lot of snake people kind of, they don't really want to be bothered with stuff like that because you kind of just want to keep your snakes and you don't really want anyone to tell you anything different. But if you really don't stand up and do anything about it, it will be illegal to keep your snakes. And it's just, it's horrible. I mean, there's people out there that don't want you to even have dogs, cats, reptiles, horses. It doesn't matter. You know, they don't, they don't care. They don't want you to have pets at all. And once reptiles start depleting, you know, I mean, they're going to go after other things too. And I, I really want more people to realize that, you know, it goes a lot further than just reptiles. The organizations that are going against our industry, they're not just going against our industry. They're going against the entire pet trade. And going against the entire pet trade is a huge thing. But if you can just take it one small thing at a time, and, I mean, if you wipe out the reptile industry, you're just going to move on to something else. And it just it's a continuous cycle. So... I'd say get as many people as you can as involved in it and let them know, you know, the actual facts. So that's, I mean, that's really my take on it. You know, we we call every single time, you know, we get any sort of wind of any sort of law or anything like that. And, um, you know, we sit there and we'll send out as many letters as we can. We'll send out as many emails as we can. And we'll sit there for a full day just making phone calls if that's what it takes. And it's it's horrible that we have to, but... It's one of those things that, you know, if you don't, then there's no one there to do it for you. Well said, man. Well, make sure to check out Ben's website at www.benrennick.com. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we close the show? Uh, that Rennick is with one N. Um, a lot of people actually spell the name with two Ns, so it's R-E-N-I-C-K. But other than that, no, I think think that about covers it. Awesome, man. Well, again, we appreciate you coming out and uh, taking time out of your busy schedule and talking with us. No problem. All right, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Her Purple Ray. Don't forget to subscribe and comment on iTunes. As always, we're streaming live on RossyReptiles.com. Her Purple Ray, out. Uh, hey, this is Mark Oz. You're listening to Her Purple Ray.